Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to the live Q&A with me, Professor Michael Scott. It's a great pleasure for you to have this chance to kind of talk to you and answer some of your questions that have been coming in through the week. So thank you so much for joining in. It's been a busy week up here at Warwick University. It's been exam board week. So we have been uh, going through all the exam boards. We have been deciding on marks for all of our students. And then we have been communicating those exams. So there's a lot of kind of very really very happy students uh, kind of around about Warwick right now and first off I wanted to say absolutely congratulations to you all you've done a fantastic uh, year's work and huge achievements as a result and I hope that you are justly proud um, of your results that you've achieved it's been a great pleasure to share in that joy with some of you seeing some of my personal duties graduating um, and kind of heading off onto the next stages of their lives and I wish them huge luck uh, don't forget us keep in touch let us know what you're up to hello Patricia hello Catherine hello everyone Thank you so much indeed for tuning in today. We're just talking about all of the graduates, not just at Warwick, obviously, and in Warwick Classics, but across the world, across the country and indeed across the world, who have been receiving their results of uh, their year's work in uh, the last week or so. So massive congratulations. I hope that you have some great summer holiday plans and then obviously heading off into next steps of the big wide world of work. Alexis, hello, please. How are you doing? Thank you so much for tuning in uh, from South America. Hello, Linda, how are you doing? Um, and can I say congratulations to you guys as well watching this. Now, uh, what's appearing on my screen is that some of you now have a little icon next to your name saying that you are top fans and uh, that's appearing when you interact with us on the Facebook page as well. Oh no, cold and rainy in Sao Paulo. I can't believe Sao Paulo is cold and rainy. Um, yes, so the top fans icon badge has started to be applied to some of you who have interacted with the page uh, kind of uh, on a regular basis. So, so far we have Katie Baldwin, Fiona Grock, Jacob uh, Steen Madsen, Chris Hunsker, Victoria Louise Howes, Alexis Brown, Hugh Somerset, Patricia Dugdale, Patricia Robinson and J. Matthew Reaver. You all have top fan badges so congratulations to you all may i say well done what an excellent achievement uh, this is and to the rest of you it's not too late this is not something that happens just once a year this is something which happens continuously so get on that facebook page facebook.com forward slash michael scott academic get interacting and you too can earn yourself a top fan page very soon indeed good afternoon james how are you doing thank you so much for tuning in so we've said congrats to uh, those who have been finishing their university exam Exams. We've said congrats to you guys with your top fan badges um, and uh, over the course of next week it's uh, a request to wish me luck. Um, on Monday we have our Warwick Classics Network uh, Teachers Day so we have about 50 teachers or so coming from schools around the country to spend the day with us in Warwick and uh, getting the chance to engage with uh, members of staff here talking about different topics that are the focus of the classical civilization GCC and ancient history uh, and A-level uh, syllabus um, and we're going to be working through those topics with them and giving them some understanding of how we think about them and teach them here at the university level um, and those talks we hope are going to be videoed if the Warwick uh, University lecture capture system works uh, as it should do so hopefully those uh, talks will then be available uh, online and you can all uh, enjoy them if you like so I'm giving a talk then so wish me luck for that and also on Monday it's a busy day on Monday uh, I have uh, what's known as a dialogic panel so I have a, an interview panel effectively for my principal fellowship of the Higher Education Academy uh, accreditation. So uh, that's kind of, it's it's kind of like an exam. I've kind of got my own exam, except it's uh, an oral exam in which I have to go and discuss uh, my thoughts and achievements and what I have done and, and what I've done against with a couple of different examiners. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'm getting those exam jitters a little bit, just a little bit as well for my dialogic panel. So hopefully when we come to the Q&A next week, I will be able to share with you some good news um, about how that's gone on uh, Monday. Um, and it will start off uh, by saying that we are going to be able to do a Q&A next week. I'm very excited about this. Next week is Thursday the 4th of July um, and you may remember from last time we flagged that there's going to be a, a big event about classics in the 21st century in the public realm on the evening of Thursday the 4th of July at Senate House in London at starting at about 5.30 p.m. and that's as part of the big classical association FIAC conference that's starting next Thursday and running through Friday, Saturday, Sunday and Monday. So that's the big annual UK Classics Conference, which this year is sort of supercharged 
by being in conjunction with the big European Association of Classics, FIAC. So in that sense, uh, it's going to be a mass meeting of classicists taking over the uh, Senate House uh, and uh, UCL uh, Institute of Education areas so everywhere around the British Museum. There'll be classicists from all over Europe if you want to come uh, and spend some time soaking up in the atmosphere. There's lots of public events going on uh, and one of those is on Thursday night about classics in the 21st century. And just before that, so kind of coming live to you from the CA FIAC conference will be our live Q&A um, at the normal time at four o'clock. So that's absolutely fantastic and hope you can join us for that. And equally hope you can come to to the event at 5.30 Classic in the 21st Century. Tickets are free, but you do have to register uh, through Eventbrite to get a ticket in advance. I'll be there, so hopefully if uh, you can get there yourselves, um, come and say hello. It'd be lovely to see you in person. Hugh, top fan, like your badge. Jonathan, do you know any good online communities or resources for learning Latin? Okay, uh, yeah, absolutely. So. Uh, I mean, one of the best ones that has, it has got online capabilities as well as Minimus. So that's the kind of, uh, this is for helping with learning of Latin in schools. Um, if it kind of more uh, kind of adult, you might want to think about living Latin. So this is a way in which you can actually go on courses to learn Latin as if it was a spoken language and you get a bit of time in Rome at the same time. Um, so that's always worth doing. Um, you can also have a look, most importantly, have a look at places like uh, the websites of Classics for All, for the Warwick Classics Network as well, our teacher resources, uh, and there'll be some links there, um, as well as uh, kind of uh, the Lytham St Anne's Classical Association branch that I'm president of, their website lsaclassics.com has some links to uh, learning Latin, learning languages as well. Now Latin was what I had to learn as part of my undergraduate degree uh, in Classics alongside Ancient Greek, so I carried on both languages uh, for quite some time, but then ended up specialising and, and preferring the ancient Greek side of things. So we'll leave it with there. Thank you very much, Hugh, for your good luck. Jonathan, thank you for your question. We need to get on with some questions that you have been sending in across the course of this week. So thank you so much, as always, for your fantastic questions that you've been sending in. It's a great pleasure to have a chance to um, come back to you. First off, there's a, there's a question here, which is kind of actually um, uh, a really interesting uh, comment and insight that someone's picked up on. So this is Maria Maku, who has been uh, talk, thinking about the Prometheus myth. So where kind of, you know, he gets uh, kind of chained to the rock and then he has his, his liver picked out every night, every day, and then every night it regenerates. Um, and she's remarking on the fact that isn't it interesting that actually in terms of the biology of the human body, the liver is the only organ that can regenerate. Bar the skin. I would guess if there's any doctors or medical experience people out there listening, please let us know kind of your thoughts on this. Um, but there seems to be some interesting overlap here between the biological possibility of our organs for regeneration and the way that myth that has centered that has centered particularly on this organ indeed. Thanks, Maria, for that. Um, Tim Brummer uh, has asked, it would be fascinating to know what the professor's must-sees in Jordan are. OK, Jordan. Oh, fantastic. You lucky devil if you're Tim, if you're off on your way there. Has anyone been to Jordan already? Have you got any particular favourites uh, kind of uh, coming into play? Uh, please let us know which are your favourites as well. Alexis, you're buffering. Oh, no, the internet. Fingers crossed it isn't uh, coming from me on my end. I'm hoping very much that the link is as good as it possibly can be so I hope very much that you guys can all follow Alexis I hope the internet uh, picks up with you soon Tim Broomer's question is it would be fascinating to know uh, about what to go and see in Jordan so any of you got any indications and particular likes of things in Jordan let us know now live or indeed through the Facebook page after the Q&A and if you've got some photos of your visits there please do share those um, photos as well and we can put them up in the photos page that we keep uh, of logs of all of your great travel um, around the place. Linda, top fan as well, like it, nice job. So where would I go in Jordan? Well, you have to go to Petra. You can't go to Jordan without going to Petra, one of the most extraordinary sites, um, and of course made infamous by any number of films, Transformers or the Indiana Jones movies. Um, Petra, absolutely, Lara's kind of agreeing with that. Um, but what you're seeing in Petra is the remains of a community who had, if you like, a time in the sun uh, when they were absolutely at the epicenter of one of the great early trade corridors linking through to the Mediterranean from the east. 
uh, and Petra really grew up and got incredibly wealthy uh, on the back of that. Um, and as a result, you see the extraordinary constructions and structures that all are working in a different way to accommodate themselves to the natural landscape. So they are carved out of the rock, the famous image of down uh, kind of in the wadi, the kind of the, the carved temple face into the rock going into the rock side and around. But of course, Petra then, once those trade routes started to shift, particularly with the development and the discovery of, say, of the monsoon winds that allowed Roman sailors to sail their boats down past what is today the uh, United Arab Emirates, the Persian Gulf, and out across the Indian Ocean with the monsoon winds direct to India, Petra lost its place in the sun and as a, as a crucial link in the trading chain. And as a result, the, the community dissolved into the desert um, and left behind the extraordinary remains that are there for us today. So definitely Petra. Um, then I Jerash as well, as a, in terms of thinking a couple of centuries later when we're fully in the kind of Roman era, um, then this is a Roman city that grew up in uh, the area of Jordan Jerash, which is really worth visiting because the scale of preservation is extraordinary. Um, often, very often, the Roman cities that are um, along the coast of North Africa and then into the Middle East are better preserved than a number of the Roman cities that are along the northern coast of the Mediterranean, partly because they haven't necessarily been built over, incorporated into more modern cities and communities, but equally they haven't just simply been as used and abused uh, for their raw building material and the dry conditions often of, of, of North Africa and of the deserts of the, of the Middle East have kept them in a better state. So Jerash is in an extraordinary state of preservation. You really do feel like you're wandering through a city that could have been in use yesterday. Um, so that would be another absolute massive one. Then, of course, you're, you've got the Dead Sea to go and swim in. I mean, you can't be seeing ruins all the time. You've got to experience something of uh, the place uh, kind of and its relaxation areas. So the Dead Sea, go and cover yourself in the mud of the Dead Sea. Your skin comes out feeling absolutely smooth. Uh, the Wadi Rum as well, obviously, if you like kind of natural landscapes and particularly if you like some canyoning and, uh, and, and climbing, uh, that's absolutely worth doing. Um, <clears throat> and there's also, I haven't been to see this, but I'm high, hugely recommended um, to it by some friends who have the Dana Water Reserve, um, Nature Reserve, um, that has been declared there in the area of Jordan. So that uh, kind of is definitely worth a visit as well. Of course, on top of that, you need to spend some time in Amman itself um, and actually uh, spending some time around there. And if you get a chance, go up to the monastery on the top of Mount Nebo and gaze at the mosaics. Um, so kind of that is an absolutely uh, worthwhile and fascinating thing to do. Great, fascinating. Thank you so much, Alexis. Oh no, I hope your internet is improving soon. Um, so Tim, thank you so much for that question. If you do go to Jordan soon, let us know where you went. Share some pictures of your travels on the Facebook page, w.facebook.com forward slash Michael Scott Academic. Um, Linda's saying, I bet you can see zillions of stars in the desert. Absolutely, yeah course and if you get the chance and you want to do it you can also go and stay uh, have a bed Bedouin experience kind of sleeping out and camping out in the desert as well so that's always worth doing um, kind of, oh you've got me kind of keen to go to Jordan back myself again now um, so Sarah Scotty's got a question as well did the people of the classical age speculate on the future uh, what did they imagine the future would be like now this is a really interesting question, Sarah. Thank you so much for asking this. Absolutely love it. Um, and I guess I'd answer it in two ways. The first is on, on the one hand, ancients were always thinking about the future in the sense that they needed to know whether the gods were well disposed towards the plans about what they wanted to do. Uh, so that is why we see both in Greek and Roman cultures of the Mediterranean, but actually in a huge number of ancient cultures spread across uh, the ancient world, different forms of consultation uh, to try and find out what the gods think about your plans. Now, in the Greek and Roman world, you could do that through cutting up an animal and examining its entrails, and particular marks on the entrails would mean particular things. You could do it um, through throwing up, di throwing dice, uh, kind of lot oracles, as they were known. Um, you could do it through uh, reading the portents in the flight of or movement of particular animals. So you didn't have to kill them necessarily, so the flights of birds or the movement of animals. In the ancient Greek world, you could do it with pretty much any animal except fish. Fish were said to be very untrustworthy um, and not worth um, following. But of course, you could also do it by consulting a priest or a priestess 
of one of the gods, normally Apollo or Zeus in the Greek world. Um, and you could go to an, what's known as an oracular sanctuary and you could ask your question uh, within the sanctuary and each sanctuary had a different way of doing things but somehow the priests would come back to you with an answer. Now the most famous example of this is Delphi um, but for example there was the oracle of Zeus up at Dodona uh, where there was a special tree where the priests listening to, listened to the rustling of the leaves um, and you wrote your question down as well as the answer on a lead tablet which then got kind of buried in the ground of the sanctuary which means we have lots of examples of the kinds of questions people asked. So on the one hand yes people were thinking about the future in all sorts of ways. Sarah yes ah but yes exactly this is the second point thank you so much they didn't imagine walking on the moon then so the flip side of of your question of imagining the future did they sort of sit there and go well you know today is the year 500 what will the year look like in uh, what will the world look like in the year 400 BC or 300 BC or in 29, 2019 um, no they didn't uh, and partly that's a dating problem because obviously we impose these year dates on them uh, now in order to make sense uh, of time in a system for us that is split between BC in the Western world, BC and CE, so before Christ, you know, before the Common Era and after the Common Era, uh, before Christ and after Christ. Um, but actually, time up until uh, you know, kind of uh, the, the Seleucid Empire. In fact, there's a fascinating book that recently just won um, one, one of the great prizes for the writing about, uh, about the ancient Greek world, the Runciman Prize, which is talking about how in the Seleucid world, and that's the empire of the um, Seleucid generals, the first of whom was one of the generals of Alexander the Great. So after the conquest of Alexander the Great all the way through to Asia and his death, his empire was divided up amongst his generals who each established themselves as the beginning of ruling dynasties. And one Seleucus became the first ruler of the Seleucid Empire. And it was in the Seleucid Empire that they started developing a dating system that was not dependent um, either on um, the ruler's name and the number of years that that particular ruler had ruled or dating uh, a year by a particular office holder um, or dating a year by a particular kind of event, a natural event or, or indeed big military event or some kind of well-known event. And that move was strikingly crucial because if you date things by the number of years that a ruler rules, you can only date up to the present because you don't know if that ruler is going to rule next year or if there's going to be a new one. And you certainly can't think about what's going to happen 20 years in the future. You wouldn't know how to actually call that time. Um, equally, if you date things uh, in relation to an office holder, you're not going to know and for the following year who the office holder is, let alone for 20 years down the time line. And if you date things by major events, then actually, well, of course you can't possibly know what those major events are going to be. So the way up until the Seleucid era, the way in which the ancient world thought about dating privileged being able to think about the past. Um, and that's why often they talk about uh, the ancients having their backs to the future facing the past. Um, but there is a big turnaround in that. And this book is absolutely fascinating, thinking about the Seleucid era, that actually when you move to a system of dating that is independent of rulers and events, you can now start to think about and, and, and conceptualise of time long in the future. Um, so you see at that point, and in fact, when, when the, the writer of this book, um, and we will post a link to this book on the, on the Facebook page, was talking about it, um, he showed a fantastic inscription uh, that's in the British Museum whereby you see this change over time um, around about when they start to come up with this novel dating system, they start to forecast when um, particular comets are going to be visible in the sky. Uh, and they're able to do it because they now have a way of talking about the future that is not dependent on uh, knowing who the ruler is or knowing what events are going to happen. Hello, Elizabeth, how are you doing? So yeah, th there's a majority of the ancient world spends its time looking towards the past and thinking about the past and actually privileging the importance of the past as a way to improve the future. And if you want to improve your future, you learn the lessons and mistakes of the past. And we see that both in the Mediterranean, we see that over in the ancient history of China, that their history is a uh, help to try and make rulers do it better in the future. But it's not until there is a dating form that allows people to actually conceptualise a future time that you start to see um, 
forecasts about certain things happening in the future. They don't imagine walking, walking on the moon. Um, I don't think, I haven't come across a text where they talk about walking on the moon, um, but uh, it actually uh, they do start to think a little bit about kind of what uh, the future might look like or how to kind of at least um, conceptualise of time moving forward in the future. Hi Sarah, thank you, so I'm glad you enjoy that. Alex, what do you think about the tale of Atlantis? Ooh, okay Atlantis, yeah, okay. I mean, wouldn't it be lovely if we could find Atlantis uh, and, and kind of find the place? Um, but uh, I'm, a, I'm really sorry, I just don't buy into the idea that Atlantis is actually a place that we can find a real physical place. I think this is uh, a story, you know, it's a myth, it's a, a, an allegory. It's perhaps originally built on, on, on the its basics on a place somewhere, but actually what it's built into is, is much more about the story than ever actually um, a real place that we can go and find. So I'm sorry about that because I'm not on the side of those who think we can find Atlantis. Hello, Helen. Hello, Laura. Oh, sorry, you've got buffering problems as well. Oh, no. Okay, fingers crossed that they improve. So how are we doing for time? Yikes. Questions. Thank you so much, Sarah, for your question about the future. That was really great, really fun uh, to think through. Um, quickly, let's have a break to think about some of the things that are in the news. Um, kind of, it's like Shangri-La, says Linda. Yes, absolutely. The kind of these kind of mythical places. Um, and, I mean, Troy is another example. There is a real Troy, um, but it's not of the scale that we can imagine when we read uh, the Iliad, for instance. But you know, clearly there was some kind of battle focused around this kind of settlement at some point in the past that then over time gets developed through the telling and retelling of the tale into becoming this extraordinary civilization. Um, so in the news, Warwick Classics Network, we've had a great week this week. You may have been seeing this on Twitter or on the Facebook page, um, but we have been able to announce the support of the AG Leventis Foundation for our work here at the Warwick Classics Network, which is absolutely wonderful. So thank you to the AG Leventis Foundation for joining us and supporting our goal to try and bring classics to as many schools as possible, both regionally and more nationally. Um, and I put a, up a new blog about this, um, thinking about classics, something for everyone, because it was a big week for me uh, last week in the sense that uh, I was being inducted as a trustee and director of Classics for All, as well as kind of working through with the AG Leventis Foundation about this great new support. And of course, there's my kind of very close to my heart being president of the Lytham, Classic, Lytham St. Anne's Classical Association. So in that sense, I was absolutely uh, very, very chuffed to be able to think about the ways in which, the great ways in which uh, Classics is pushing forward to ensure that everyone has a chance um, to study Classics uh, if they want to do so so please do take a look at that blog it's on my website so w uh, michaelscottweb.com and if you fl flick to the blog page you can have a look at some of my thoughts there and do leave your comments as well kind of via the facebook page um from the archaeology news network we've had early celts in burgundy appropriating mediterranean products um so this is kind of how this is absolutely brilliant this is coming from researchers at the ludwig maximilian universität in munich and also the university of tubingen um and they have been showing how early celts in eastern france were taking not just Mediterranean pottery uh, that was containing olive oil and wine, but they seem to have been sort of copying Mediterranean feasting practices. So they were going, oh, kind of look at how those Mediterranean lot kind of do it over there. That looks quite good, relaxing on a couch and having a nice glass of wine and something to eat. Um, so yeah, absolutely brilliant that kind of that's been able to be shown. Uh, and then what's on? We've got some great things uh, coming on at the moment. I wanted to remark to you about a free online course at York University, which is also being run as part of FutureLearn. Uh, so this is exploring Stone Age archaeology. Um, kind of, uh, it's a free four-week course and it's starting on the 1st of July so if you have a look either at the York website for that or indeed for Future Learn um, and thank you for to Chris to Chris Hansker who has shared that um, and who has signed up himself to do the course so Chris let us know what you think uh, kind of as you come out uh, of the course the other day uh, on the other end in four weeks time Pam Brown also has been sharing all the amazing things that have been happening on Crete recently and we've put some of these up on the Facebook page so thank you Pam for sharing those the Cretan night the European Music Festival the Royalist Boys Choir, the Joanna Xaeli Trio, the Polyphonic Ensemble Apollon, uh, traditional Greek dances. It sounds like we should all get down to Crete uh, this summer to enjoy some of the festivities. Pam, let us know if you get to any of these. Do send us some photos as well of the things that you've been getting up to, particularly some photos of you doing traditional Greek dancing uh, or indeed at the Cretan World Music Festival. That's what I 
might want to see uh, pictures of indeed. And then great news coming through for uh, November time. So uh, as I said, I'm president of the Lindham and Anne's Classical Association branch, which is the largest in the country. And this November, we are very honoured because we are hosting the presidential address of the national CA president, which is, of course, Professor Dame Mary Beard. And she is coming up to Lindham um, to give a series of talks. Uh, so these will be strictly a kind of need. You'll need to get a ticket uh, for this um, kind of things. But if you are in the area of Lindham and Anne's, that's going to be Saturday the 9th of November so keep an eye out for how you can get a ticket uh, it, I'll be up there uh, welcoming Mary to Lytham along with lots of others and it would be lovely 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 to see you uh, and before that in September here at Warwick we also have the British Science Festival that's taking place here at the University of Warwick um, and on the 13th of September I'm going to be talking uh, there um, thinking about uh, virtual ways of putting ancient Greece on telly uh, and doing some of the virtual reality and uh, laser scanning stuff um, that I've been doing for the Ancient Invisible Cities program. So kind of uh, hope you can come along and join us for the 13th of September at Warwick. So um, absolutely fantastic stuff going on. Thank you very much for letting um, us know about the things that you're up to. Keep that coming in. Anything that you do notice that you think would be worthwhile to sharing uh, to all uh, the users of the Facebook page would be absolutely fantastic. Hello, Anthony. Hello, Linda. Thank you so much indeed. Have we got time for some more questions? We've got time for maybe one or two more questions before our half hour is up. Try and get maybe a, a fun one and a serious one. Here we go. So Rebecca Louise, how would you define the Panhellenic nature of Delphi and Olympia? Ah, oh, Rebecca, you've asked a question close to my heart. My, my, my PhD was about exactly this, the Panhellenic nature of the sanctuaries of Delphi and Olympia. Um, now, what do we mean by Panhellenic? Well, it was a word that got banded around a lot kind of in the latter half of the 20th century to effectively mean all the Greeks coming together uh, and acting rather harmoniously with one another. Now we know that Greeks very rarely did this. They spent an awful lot of time actually fighting one another um, and not really getting on very well with one another. But it was claimed that in these key sanctuaries, places like Delphi, Olympia, Isthmia, Nemea, um, that a different spirit took hold, the Panhellenic spirit um, that brought them together and made them forget their differences uh, and instead um, sort of got on with one another and indeed it was in that spirit that things like the modern Olympic Games were relaunched at the end of the 19th century um, thinking about them as places where people could come together in competition but come together uh, to remember kind of what what united them rather than what divided them and equally Delphi being made a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1987 uh, kind of that was one of the principal kind of reasons for the UNESCO uh, World Heritage status that it was a place that brought people together both in the past and indeed in the present. Now my problem with this is that actually the word Panhellenic is very rarely used in the ancient Greek. Um, it's certainly not often used uh, about these sanctuaries and it's certainly not often used in relation to how people behaved in them. Uh, and when you look at the kind of sorts of behaviour, certainly through the archaic and classical periods, um, you do not see Greeks getting together and being all chummy and forgetting about all their differences. In fact, what you see them doing is kind of acting out um, severe competition with one another, not perhaps through fighting one another on the battlefield, but through uh, what I would term monument war. Wars, um, so kind of monuments or facing up against one another that were erected in the sanctuaries as well as of course competing at the Olympic Games with one another and then competing through the monumental celebrations of those victories um, as well at Olympia. Uh, so I would argue that actually at places like Delphi and Olympia all the, all the Greeks were coming to them because they were great spaces in which to be seen and to show off and to make sure that things you wanted to be known about you were known but they were doing that in an an often intensely competitive atmosphere um, and so while these were places that brought people together it was not necessarily bringing them together in um, harmony as we kind of sort of like to try and think they were and particularly with Delphi which has been mooted as a kind of potential precursor of today's EU and UN uh, I think we put a rod to our back we shouldn't necessarily do. We kind of uh, imagine that the past did it better than we do it today, when in fact actually the past did it just about as well um, as we are doing today, or we're doing as well today as we have ever done. 
Uh, so Rebecca, thank you very much indeed for that question. And very quickly, I think we've got, uh, oh, seconds, seconds left. We can have a fun question from Alexis Brown. Um, Boris Johnson, hmm. Uh, how was photographed wearing socks of an ancient, with an ancient Assyrian king on them? Apparently he bought them from the British Museum. Ooh, who would you choose to wear on your socks is the question that's come in from Alexis. Brilliant, kind of excellent question. Who would I choose to wear on my socks? Well, actually this week, uh, after Father's Day, we, I was given a pair of socks uh, with a top dad on them. So I was wearing those proudly uh, for a little while. Um, but uh, kind of, and I do have friends who indeed kind of have different socks for each day of the year uh, with themed uh, kind of um, uh, images or writing on them uh, relating to different days of the year. So there you go, that's serious, serious sock, um, sockage, I think, I guess we might call it. Uh, but for me, who would I choose to have on my socks? Ooh, it's a tough one. Who would I choose? I would like. Um, kind of on the one hand, quite like that picture of the Pythia sitting on her tripod. That would be quite cool. Um, kind of may maybe a Pericles figure, mm -hmm, maybe. Maybe a Socrates, kind of trying to absorb some of that wisdom uh, as well as we go. And Alexander the Great, I think that would be a little much. I don't think I'd quite go um, that far. Uh, but tell us what you would like to have on your socks. Who would be the figure that you would have on the socks? Isabel says the three graces. That's a great idea, really nice. The muses, yeah, absolutely. What a fantastic idea idea to have on your socks kind of we should all go into business we could get some socks made up with different kind of classical figures on them and see where we go Lara says Hector very noble very noble kind of who would go for Achilles oh the irony of having socks with Achilles on them uh, and covering up your heel um, kind of Persephone from Greece absolutely wow here we are kind of we've obviously hit a nerve here Alexis great question as to what kind of ancient character people would want on their socks so I Leonidas from Alexis fantastic fantastic so keep your thoughts coming in over the week to the Facebook page about what you would have on your socks um, and we will take it from there and see what we can do maybe as Christmas presence going forward. We have run out of time. Thank you so much for all your fantastic questions. As I said, we will be back next week, Thursday, the 4th of July, coming live uh, from the CA conference just before the big uh, public event about classics in the 21st century. And I hope uh, that I'll see some of you there. Come and say hello if you are. Um, and indeed, I'll report on how things go on Monday fingers crossed for my dialogic panel um, and I look forward to answering some more of your questions then so keep them coming in via the Facebook page facebook.com forward slash Michael Scott Academic or to the Gmail Michael uh, Scott Academic at gmail.com have a lovely rest of the week great weekend enjoy the heat wave that's coming to the UK if you're not already being bathed in heat uh, somewhere in Europe at the moment um, and uh, kind of we'll see you next week take care